So how did you get to needing the heart in the first place? Well, I was playing squash at Lawrenceville with someone and all of a sudden I just dropped to the ground. Um, my heart was racing very fast and I realized something was pretty bad. So I, believe it or not, I walked to the infirmary and asked for the doctor. He came, helped me, uh, and he had me lie down. He called the hospital and then they came to get me and took me to the hospital. Uh, what followed that was uh, a transfer to the hospital in the University of Pennsylvania because they knew there was some electrical problem going on in my heart and they wanted to study it. So I spent a month there. This is way back. This is 16 years before the transplant. And I spent a month there f helping them figure out what was wrong with me and what to do about it. So I left the hospital there with them having a plan and I knew that, um, that the heart was troubled but it looked like it was going to be steady for a while and it was. Um, but then about 15 years later I started to get uh, congestive heart failure which means the heart's weakening, you don't have as much energy, you, you gain weight because your heart can't pump the fluids out of you and uh, finally, uh, my heart was so weak that I couldn't walk more than 10, 15 steps without having to stop to rest. So my doctor, a wonderful woman, Dr. Jessup, down at the University of Hospital of Pennsylvania, she put her arm around me and she said, Tom, I think it's time. We're going to get you through this. So I went into the hospital where the, I'd be... Um, available in case a heart came up. And I was very lucky because uh, the wait was only three weeks, partly because my medicine was setting off my defibrillator. I was in rough shape. I could go at any time. So on October 1st, in, 19, in 206, I had the transplant. So um, this man, do you know anything about him, anything about his family? I didn't at the time. But I do now. Um, what I did was I wrote the family to thank them, and they responded. In those days, you had to send it to a company to s screen the letters just to be sure they're appropriate. But they <clears throat> got back to me, and they let us communicate directly after about a year. So from that point on, the wife of the man whose heart is inside me and I talked on the phone at least once a month. Mm -hmm. We uh, both have kids in their 20s, and kids in their 20s often have creative ways of living out their lives, and parents don't always know <laughs> what to do. So we talk yeah. to each other about our children mm -hmm. just to see if anyone had a good idea on a problem that might be happening. All right, so <laughs> we're gonna jump jump in time a bit, and you get a letter from the daughter, actually, um, saying that her father's heart is inside of you and she's getting married, and she'd like you to walk her down the aisle. Um, could you speak on its importance and what this meant to you? Well, this letter stunned me. I mean, I, I had to sit and just reread it because it was such a wonderful idea, and the only place it could have come from, of course, was her, because it was her wedding. Yeah. So. I thought about it and, and the only thing holding me back was the thought that I might have difficulty doing it just because I would be so emotional. But I called her immediately and I said, listen, I'm going to do this. It's a wonderful, beautiful idea. Thank you for inviting me and uh, if I'm a little weepy, you'll have to help me through it. She said, fine. So <laughs> I understand you met exactly. Yeah. 24 hours before the wedding. Yes. What was it like meeting her? Well, we met, I met her, I met Bernice, and I met Michelle, her sister, uh, at the church where the wedding would be taking place. We met at about the time we were gonna do the rehearsal and then the rehearsal dinner. Yeah. It was very emotional because I was aware that I owed my life to these three people and to Michael 
the donor. And somehow we, we were all coming together for something really special, mm -hmm. um, Jenny's marriage. And it just hit me um, just how grateful I was and how much respect I had for them for thinking about when they were in their worst moment, thinking about helping others. I mean, there's no more um, altruistic gift you can give than the gift of life to someone you don't even know. It's yeah. not your son, it's not your spouse. It is someone you don't know. And so I was, I wasn't completely overwhelmed because I've been preparing for it, but I was very emotional. So nine years ago, you spoke at a school meeting and uh, you inspired a group of Laurentians to take action and form a club called um, Life Saving Lives. Right. Um, can you talk about the club and their mission? Sure. Um, after I spoke to the school, told them my story, two seniors, two juniors came to see me and these young women asked if we could form a club that I might advise um, called Live Saving Lives. And mm -hmm. the purpose of the club would be to uh, bring awareness to the positive nature of organ donation. And I said, oh, I'd love to do that. Um, and so we started the club nine years ago. We've done things like raffle off feeds for houses. Um, we've gone to the, the house that we support uh, to cook meals for the folks who are there with their uh, family members who are going to get transplants. Mm -hmm. And we every year have a benefit dinner, which we raise a fair amount of money um, for organ donor awareness and for the house. And so far, these, this group of kids from Live Saving Lives have raised over $31,000, which they've contributed to the house. And it, it makes me so proud to know that the kids here care enough about um, organ donation to work as hard as they have. So organ transplants save lives, and not everybody seems to fully comprehend that on the daily. Um, just how important are these transplants and their donors? Well, I'll give you a sense of it. Uh, 21 people every day die because they couldn't get a transplant. So over a period of a year, that's a lot of people. See, there are many, many more people who need organs than there are people who give them. So it's really important for people to be willing to, to donate. Um, because only 2% of folks who pass away are eligible. And then take another percent away for folks who have issues that won't allow the transplant to take place. Um, so it's, it's pretty few people mm -hmm. that are actually eligible and so every, every person is important. So last, um, last question. What would you say to the man who more or less gave a part of his whole to, um, to save the life of somebody who he didn't know? The first thing I would say to him is I would bless him and thank him for, for doing what he did. Because it wasn't just one organ, it was four. And uh, I got the heart, but other people got other organs. For every person who gets an organ, not only does that person go on, but 50 people are benefited by it. His family, his extended family, his friends or her friends. Um, so it's, it, it makes many, many people happy. And the donors who are the heroes in this, and they are true heroes because this is about as altruistic as you can be. Um, the donors also feel that, the donors' families, also feel that something wonderful has happened. Because they can see a person who's alive who wouldn't have been and having a productive life. And so, I, I, you know, there's just no question that he has made a difference and his family's made a difference. The second thing I would say to him is how wonderful his family is. Not only did they decide 
to give away the organs that would save other people. But they are just warm, wonderful people, and I got to know them at the wedding, and I'll, we will stay in touch because we just have, now, at one point, it was kind of an intellectual connection. <clears throat> now it's visceral. Now it's inside us because we've met and we've talked and we've shared things. And um, so I'd let him know that he should be very proud of his family. <laughs>